For somebody who doesn't know the industry well, what's the best way to target the best of the best? Is that to do the research yourself or is it to find somebody who publishes a newsletter, tracks the industry really closely and says, I think this is, these are the 10 best companies in the industry. If you buy these 10, you should be getting you know, the real pearls. Nobody that I know publishes that because it's not timeless. You can't get somebody to come back next month if you've already given them the 10 best names of the decade. Uh, so <laughs> I, I would suggest either doing your own work or getting out a pen and writing down a few names right now. Um, Let's do it. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with seasoned natural resources investor, Rick Rule. If you haven't yet watched part one of our discussion with Rick, in which he explains why he sees a bright future ahead for natural resource stocks due to both rising demand and depleting supply, head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthion and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment perspective that Rick and our partners at New Harbor Financial share in this video. Oh, and if you haven't done so yet, don't forget to subscribe to this channel by clicking the red subscribe button below. And now here's part two of our interview with Rick Rule. My belief for most of your listeners who don't want to do a lot of work and take a lot of risk is that they concentrate on the best of the best. Uh, they de-risk their stock selection and perhaps be uh, willing to even underperform the index a little bit by de-risking it. You, you go where I'm, know where I'm going with this. You could, as an example, buy an ETF, which would give you 40 or 50 names. The problem with that is that 25 names are ones that if you looked at them carefully, you wouldn't want to own. So I'm beginning to think that for most investors, building a portfolio of the five or six or seven best gold producers in the world even at the risk of marginally underperforming the index, but having no individual company risk is probably a better way to go. In my experience, the market beta that you get in a precious metals bull market is so extraordinary that for most people, trying to outperform the index is a waste of time. All right. Well, that was, that's what I was going to ask. So I'm glad you, you, you mentioned that. So for people who are watching, um, just two terms in case you're unfamiliar with them. There is the beta, and that is the return that the market is giving you or the sector that you're investing in is giving you. Then where there's what's called alpha, which is the individual return above the market or below the market uh, that an individual <laughs> company will give you. And what stock pickers try to do is try to pick stocks that they think are going to have really high alpha, and they're going to beat the market with those. Um, and some do, but of course, there's a lot more risk that comes with that. And what Rick is saying here is, hey, you might just want to just you know, take this one easy and say, look, there's so much upside to the mining industry. Just owning the sector itself uh, gets you that high beta at much, much lower risk than trying to get out there and pick individual winners. Um, Rick, is that a good summary of what you were sort of implying there? It is. And for many clients, uh, I'm willing to underperform beta by simply owning the best of the best, uh, taking the risk that I don't enjoy the upside and the marginal producers. Uh, you know, it. Uh, foregoing, if you will, that leverage uh, in favor of uh, capturing all or most of the beta with no single company failure risk. Great. Okay. So um, I, I want to move sort of into investing strategy here, like putting it into action for folks. So um, please tell me if this is not, if this doesn't apply to all natural resource sectors. Um, because uh, I'm going to make some sweeping comments here. If, 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 if there's some idiosyncrasies of individual sectors, just, just correct me here. But um, people could um, buy the, the beta easily um, because they could, they could buy an ETF, right? So I'm just mm -hmm. going to say there's uh, GDX. So we're talking about yep. the precious metals mining space. GDX uh, has all the, the majors in there, right? And there's probably, to your point, a number of companies in there that ideally you might not want to own if you really looked at all the prospectuses, but they've got all the big guys in there. And that's just a simple mouse click. You're buying one company mm -hmm. capturing a fair amount of the beta. You could then do what you're talking about, which is the additional legwork of saying, you know what, I just want the best of the best. Um, for somebody who doesn't know the industry well, 
what's the best way to target the best of the best? Is that to do the research yourself or is it to find somebody who publishes a newsletter, tracks the industry really closely and says, I think this is, these are the 10 best companies in the industry. If you buy these 10, you should be getting you know, the real pearls. Nobody that I know publishes that because it's not timeless. You can't get somebody to come back next month if you've already given them the 10 best names of the decade. Uh, so <laughs> I, I would suggest either doing your own work or getting out a pen and writing down a few names right now. Um, Let's do it. Given that I'm no longer securities licensed, I can actually give out information that's useful to investors. It's very pleasant. All right. I like the emancipated um, brick rule. Let's go. Yeah. Let's hear them. Uh, Franco Nevada is the best of the best of the world. I mean, it's just the single finest precious metals mining company in the world. Not cheap, uh, but 80% operating margins. It deserves to be expensive. Uh, I would say that Wil uh, Wheaton Precious, uh, the streamer, uh, fits in that same category. Uh, if you are willing to come down the quality trail a little bit, but still maintain very, very, very good margins, royalty gold, uh, Royal Gold, uh, another royalty and streaming company. Uh, uh, I think Barrick, uh, Agnico Eagle, which is the best capital allocator uh, in the space, certainly uh, deserves mention. Uh, and one could, if one wanted, uh, just stop there with five names. My suspicion is that you would want to add the biggest gold mining company in the world, Newmont. Uh, one criticism I have of them is too many tier two, which is too many second class deposits relative to their top class deposits. But if I'm right uh, about the direction uh, of the gold market, and if I'm also right about their development pipeline, that needs to be included back in the best. My own personal portfolio goes to value. Uh, and so in my own personal portfolio, I add in Polymetal and Polyrus, uh, the cheapest major gold companies in the world. And I would argue having the best development pipelines in the world. Many investors are afraid to invest in Russian domiciled companies. Uh, I'm afraid not to. Uh, I regard all countries, including the one I live in, the United States, as being politically risky. Uh, it's just that we regard political risk that we don't understand with more disfavor than we regard political risk that we understand. So I personally would add those two Russian companies, which I believe are the two finest relative to their price gold mining companies in the world. All right. Well, that's saying something coming from somebody with your experience and expertise. Um, Rick, that, that's phenomenal. Thank you for doing this. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, so... You know, as uh, as we look to uh, you know invest in these companies, uh, or in, you know these companies being natural resources companies, not necessarily the specific ones you just mentioned. Um, uh, but but I guess the ones that you're, you you just rolled out there, Rick, are those um, kind of the ones that you just sort of think are, are good for the long haul? Uh, in other words, you, you kind of said, look, you think juniors are, are too expensive right now. The, the bigger ones are fairly valued. Um, you know, clearly they're going to be ebbs and flows or whatnot. But it, I sort of had the impression you thought these are the ones that are really going to sort of like do the best over the long haul with the lowest risk. Well, the lowest risk means uh, that you minimize to the extent that you can management failure. Uh, and I can't speak with all of them in terms of the probability of management failure. Certainly, when you look at Franco Nevada, they have a 30-year track record of the intelligent deployment of capital, as does Agnico Eagle. In both cases, you have management teams that are like myself, long of tooth. <laughs> you, you don't know as much about the acumen of the middle managers as perhaps you ought to. But these are companies that have a, a culture of uh, intelligent deployment of capital, which you hope continues that have development pipelines uh, that means that you're not buying depleting assets and that operate in the highest return on capital employed decile in the world and the lowest uh, um, uh, all-in sustaining cost uh, environment in the world. In other words, superior assets, superior people, superior development pipelines. Uh, your risk is that they do something stupid with those gems that they control. Great point. So um, look, there's 
a whole ton of questions that we didn't get to. And, and even in that last topic there, Rick, um, so basically I'm, I'm gonna have to have you back on again uh, as, as early as works for you uh, in your busy schedule. But I would love to go through kind of Rick Rule's checklist for sort of what he looks for when looking you know, at a, at a mining company, whether to invest or not. And I'm sure that that differs a bit by industry. Um, we don't have enough time to, to do that justice sure. right now, but if you're open to it, I would love to have you back on to, to dive deeply into that. I'd love to, and I, I'd love to visit if you thought it was appropriate for a different checklist, which is a checklist where investors ask themselves what's important to them and how much work they're willing to do. Uh, an investment that suits an old fat rich guy like me uh, might be very different from an investment that would suit a different investor and speculator. Uh, I, I've enjoyed uh, 40 years of working with investors, and, and I actually believe that due diligence uh, begins with one's own psychoanalysis. In other words, how much work one is willing to do, what one's time preference is, uh, what one's needs and wants are, are the preconditions to the companies that one might, that one might choose to interrogate. Uh, and I'm leery about putting the cart before the horse. So uh, that's my own way of inviting myself back onto your show twice rather than once. Okay, great. I absolutely a thousand percent agree with that. So yes, add that list to the uh, to the docket too. All right, Rick. Well, look as we wrap up here, um, do you just sort of have any any general advice to the viewer here who is concerned about the macro risks that we talked about at the beginning? Um, you know, beyond uh, you know looking into the specific uh, names that you mentioned there and, and looking at those uh, as potential, uh, you know investments to consider. Do you have any sort of general advice for these people who are, 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 you know, excited by the potential opportunity that the commodity space is offering, but at a higher level, they're very worried about today's asset prices and everything else that are at record highs. Um, they don't want to become collateral damage if there is, uh, you know, some sort of reckoning here, um, you know, in the general market. Um, uh, to that type of viewer, who I think probably meets the DNA pretty well, the folks that you worked with at Sprott, um, the clients you worked with at Sprott, what, what, what would you say to them uh, given this moment in history and in, in your outlook? Three pieces of advice. Um, the big thinkers in the world don't want you to hold any cash. So hold cash, despite <laughs> the fact that the purchasing power of your cash declines in value over time. Uh, holding cash gives you option value. If the circumstance that we're in gives rise to a conference, uh, confidence in liquidity crisis, and we experience the same type of market that we experienced in 2008, I'm not saying we're going to, but if we did, having the cash would give you the tools and perhaps the courage to take advantage of that situation rather than being taken advantage of. Uh, 2008 turned out to be a very, very, very good time for me uh, because I went into it cashed up and I had the guts to use the cash. So the first thing is uh, hold cash. And by the way, from my viewpoint, gold is good, albeit volatile cash. The second thing is in terms of cyclical investments like natural resources and precious metals, emphasize for most of your portfolio, high quality. Bull markets give you so much beta that for most of your portfolio, you don't need to outperform the beta. Importantly, in a yield-starved world, the decapitalization of resource businesses is a wonderful way to generate yield. So look to companies that, in addition to having promise over three to four years, uh, compensate you for the net present value of your cash by giving you high dividend yields, which are certainly achievable uh, in natural resources. To the extent that you speculate, and by the way, I love speculation. Uh, understand, first of all, your risk limitations. Use money that you can afford to lose half of for speculation and understand that being a successful speculator means that you have to do a lot of work. I argue as a rule of thumb that speculative portfolios uh, should have the same number of stocks as the number of hours per month that a speculator wants to work, understanding his or her own portfolio. The idea that uh, got a hunch, bet a bunch. Uh, I've watched people try it for 40 years and I've never watched it work. Wow, um, Rick, thank you. Those are incredibly wise, uh, sage advice from a, a man who's been in the trenches for <laughs> honestly more decades than, uh, than most people have been investing. 
And uh, to have summed it up so succinctly and powerfully like that, um, thank you. That really is, that those are exactly the types of gems that we hope to unearth on these video programs. So Rick, as we wrap up here, um, I know that we mentioned at the beginning that you're retired. Um, if, if folks wanna learn more about you, follow you, et cetera, where should they go? Well, I, as I say, I'm liberated now. I'm no longer a Sprout employee. Uh, so I encourage those discussions. Uh, my friends at Sprout have left me a facility if anybody cares what I think about their natural resource portfolios, they can go to a website, sproutusa.com forward slash ranking. That website will change in a month, but that's what it is right now. Uh, leave your natural resource stocks, and I personally will rank them one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. I'll comment on individual issues if I think that my comments uh, have any value. And in addition to that, if you mention uh, in the question line charts, I'll uh, include two charts, not for technical analysis, but rather as illustrations. One is the Barron's Gold Mining Index, the most inclusive and longest running gold equities index existant, which I think is wonderful for understanding uh, how gold bull markets and bear markets work. The second uh, is the Goldman Sachs commodity chart, which goes back 100 years and talks about how uh, commodities and industrial materials are valued relative to other asset classes going back 100 years. Those two charts are great visual aids to uh, encapsulate the discussion that we've been having today. Once again, SprottUSA.com forward slash rankings. No obligation. I'm not a broker. <laughs> uh, so happy to have that discussion. Wow, great. Well, Rick, well, when, when we edit this, we'll put the URL up over the screen so people can clearly great. see it. Uh, I suspect you're going to get an, an avalanche of people going there uh, once this video goes live. That is an incredibly generous uh, offering that you're making to folks there to provide that, that, uh, that type of feedback to their, their submissions. Um, I, anyways, uh, I, I'm so excited for uh, to share this video once it goes out, but I'm, I'm even more excited to have you back on again to talk about the uh, the other uh, checklists and other types of, um, uh, you know, bringing your sage and highly experienced wisdom to the investor that's trying to make sense of this incredibly confusing time that we have going on right now. And I think, uh, you know, people who are who are have been waiting for the commodity complex to wake up are getting very excited. At the same time, they're looking at the nosebleed level of the overall market, and uh, there's just so many crash currents out there that we really need seasoned experts like you to help people keep a firm hand on the tiller. So with all that said, Rick, thank you so much for coming on the program. We'll let you get back to your busy, busy retirement, it sounds like, <laughs> but look forward to having you back on the program again soon. A pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you for having me on. All right. All right. Well, Mike and John, yet another phenomenal guest expert and one that I think you guys owe a nice uh, big fat check to uh, because he just put the ball right up there fat on the tee for you guys uh, saying that, hey, uh, owning cash is a sage thing to be doing in this market environment. Um, you know, obviously, he's a big fan of the precious metals industry, uh, oil and gas industry, et cetera. I mean, that almost sort of sounds like the current um, allocation of the New Harbor portfolio. So, uh, Mike, why don't we start with you this week? Um, what were your reactions to, to Rick's brilliance there? I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Rick. Um, I just made some notes here. I totally agree with what Rick said and and. New Harbor was on with Rick on a video last year, and and uh, I remember him saying that um, you know don't worry about picking individual stocks so much in the in the gold mining sector, silver mining sector. Worry about getting exposure to beta, primarily. Just summarizing what he said, and that's you know that we believe in that. We think that the move in precious metals uh, has been strong and will continue to be strong for some time, and we're you know it's been a core position for us. We do have some hedges um in place um, that, that make us and our clients feel a little bit more comfortable with the ride we've got some callers where we take a partial position and short call options and we buy put options on the downside but you know by and large we we believe, agree you know get some beta uh the biggest exchange traded fund that owns gold stocks has like 52 different stocks and there are a lot of the ones that rick just mentioned and in so far as he talked about individual names those those individual names were great too there was a lot of um royalty companies in there which is it's a good safe way to you know to to, to participate in the, in the sector so overall it's really good and um i totally agree with with resource stocks in particular not just gold you know oil and gas we've got to position oil stocks as well so uh with that i'll pause but uh enjoyed it
All right. Well, John, let me let me give you a chance to react. And also, um, you know, the precious metals and the mining complex has, has been doing pretty well over the past week or two. Um, so uh, you know, in your answer, if you can just sort of comment on uh, whether that's translated into anything uh, positive for the New Harbor portfolio. Yeah, yeah, we, we've definitely seen a, a tick up uh, related to the precious uh, mining stocks that we have in our portfolio. And uh, while we do have those hedge, uh, we, we do set the hedges uh, with tolerances such that it doesn't snuff out those, those bounces higher uh, when they do occur. And, and to be fair, um, the recent weak, weakness in, in recent months uh, was, a, was a drain on, on the accounts a bit too. But there again, that's why we have hedges and we were able to, to soften and mitigate uh, or at least take off the table any material downside there. So, but absolutely. And, and there's big picture themes here. Um, you know, obviously the inflationary impulse that's starting to read through the data is helpful. Um, you know, um, the dollar has kind of uh, turned down on, on uh, what was a short term, you know, move higher. Um, and we're at kind of a critical test of support for the dollar right now. Um, likely see the dollar go lower here, which is generally a pretty good, uh, um, you know, counter, uh, counter move relative to precious metal and other commodity prices. Um, so yeah, we're, we're very uh, we're glad to be in the space. We agree with Rick that what we've seen here was more of a um, you know cyclical uh, pullback in a, in a much longer and broader um, uh, bull market rally in the space. All right, uh, I want to get to gold specifically in a second, but I, I, I do want to. You know, one of the big reasons I was excited to bring Rick on is is he is an expert in all sorts of different natural resources. Um, and he talked a bit about um, water, uranium oil. I know you guys have a position in oil, um, but presumably you guys are following, you know, the entire natural resource complex as well. And just looking for, you know, attractive entry prices and, and whatnot. I see you nodding there, John. So maybe I'll go back to you quickly here, but just, um, you know, uh, give us a quick read in terms of your guys' yeah. view of the, this commodity cycle. Is it something that you're planning on investing more in while still, you know, I, I guess maybe also talk the fact you're still holding a chunk of cash. And my sense is, is you're holding that there to move it, you know, lots of places, but particularly into natural resources. But once the uh, the value ratios are maybe a little more attractive, but, but don't yeah, remember what we're doing. Absolutely. We are looking very, have been looking very closely and continue to look very closely at the broader commodity complex. We do think we're probably on the verge of a longer term super cycle. You might use that term. Uh, near term, we, we think the, the complex has gotten a little ahead of itself. I know Rick mentioned early on in his comments that, you know, he, he's surprised we got here on some of these commodities so quickly. Um, you know, we, we agree that they've probably gotten a little uh, overheated in the short term here. You know, lumber was, was a poster child and, you know, we've seen some pretty dramatic lumber recently. So that doesn't, we don't think that means that the broader commodity cycle is, is over. We think this is probably just a cooling off period. Um, so we do have energy exposure, and we, we, we did add that uh, for our larger accounts that can take the position um, back in December. It's been a, a nice, strong sector for us. We've been keeping an eye on basic materials and, and other agricultural type um, um, commodity plays. Um, you know, funny, just today we were, in, we always banter around different uh, charts and, and economic and, and market data. And just today we looked at two charts, you know, big, big picture macro charts on, on commodities. You know, one is a chart that, you know, we have shared, I think, before on some of these videos. Um, you, if you look at the commodity index price, you know, uh, as a, you know, or the S&P 500, for example, as a ratio to the CRB uh, commodity index, um, rarely has the commodity index been this low or this lowly priced relative to the stock market in many, many, many decades. Now we've seen that moderate a little bit in recent weeks and, and months as commodities have, have taken a turn higher, but man, we're still still are vastly um, undervalued there. Now, of course, we're measuring that against a stock market bubble that's arguably never been as extreme as it is now. So there's some, you know, bias of comparison there. But we also looked at a chart that you know showed you know some correlation between like credit impulse measures, and particularly in China, and, and the cycl cyclical prices of commodities. And you know, on, on some of the shorter term indicators, it certainly looks like uh, commodities have gotten broadly ahead of themselves, even if it's in a, a longer term bull market. Great, and John, do me a favor, send me over those charts after if you can, I'll overlay them while you're talking. Sure. Um, all right, Mike, coming back to you, um, again, I'm gonna get to a, a gold specific question here in a second, but um, 
if, if you could literally just give a quick update on your guys's hedging approach um, for the new viewers here, um, because I think it's, it's particularly appropriate right now where you have a sector that you're excited about, it's long-term upside potential. So you wanna have it, you know, a position within it. But as Rick was saying earlier, and John just mentioned, you know, there are periods where it may run a little bit ahead of itself. Um, and so it sounds like what you guys are doing is, you know, uh, as prices increase, um, you are, you know, putting hedges against your positions. And as the prices go up, you're moving your hedges up as well, such that if there is a correction, you know, mid-cycle, um, you've got downside protection uh, in that case. Um, a, did I describe it correctly? And B, say whatever else you want. I just want folks to, to be aware that there are ways to protect your downside uh, when going after the larger term upward opportunity here. Yeah, so there's a few facets to that question and to the answer, I think. Um, and I'm not sure if your question pertains to gold itself or the miners, but- It's really any I, position, but I think it, it, it sounds pretty relevant to all the commodity sectors that risk was, uh, I think risk so was talking too. about. Yeah, I mean, like John said, some of the commodities have gotten a little ahead of themselves, lumber, wheat, soybeans, corn, the, you know, those agricultural commodities have, have fallen, uh, well, they've corrected uh, quite a bit over the last couple of weeks and maybe setting up for some kind of entry. Um, really left behind was gold and silver bullion for the longest time. I mean, it's certainly in an uptrend, but uh, since it's high in August of 2020, gold had a 20% pullback for instance, you know, I mean, it was in this bear market and we were watching the support shelf at 1760 for a long time. We said that on, on some videos. And then, you know, we, there was one last stab down to the 1680 to 1720 zone, which we thought was a good, a really good place for people to establish positions and, you know, maybe add if they, if they felt like they didn't have enough. And I, I will get to the answer about hedging, but I, I guess I want to say that for your core position, we don't really think that uh, if, if somebody has a core position in, in bullion, you know, locked away in the safe or something like that, they probably don't have to hedge that. There's, there's ways to do it, but it's, it's kind of expensive and difficult. Right. But, but, so but that, start that, with, that, you know, that, putting... That, that's risk. That's Rick's, you know, have your insurance position. Right? Yeah, put your insurance position away and don't think about it, right? And, you know, what? what, what so we, when we walk, uh, work with people, we're, we're having them set that up. But then over and above that, you know, we've got a core position in our managed portfolio, for mining stocks, and that's much more volatile, you know, maybe three to four to five times more volatile. And we actually think that the mining stocks are at fantastic valuations. And, you know, Rick pointed out all the great reasons to own them too. But, you know, in March of last year, um, the largest, uh, you know, gold mining exchange traded fund ETF GDX went from 30 to 16 in two weeks. And we had some protection on it to, to help us through that. Um, we're at a time where the S&P could literally have a, a mini a mini crash or even something worse, you know, because of a lot of the technical things we're seeing. So we love mining shares, but there could be a downside reaction that we want to hedge against. And that's where we think the hedges are important. So nothing and nothing is free. You can't put hedges or insurance on without spending something for it. And it can often be expensive. So we put put we, we use put options on our positions, GDX, for example. So we'll buy put options, but we'll pay for them or most of them by selling call options at a price above the current price. So if GDX is at 40, uh, just using an example, we might sell call options up at 44 on a piece of it. And then we'll use that money to buy some deeper out of the money put options, maybe down at 32 or something like that. So the deductible is going to be between 40 and 32. So we can't ever offer somebody no deductible, but what we can do is make the ride safer and feel better. So yeah, in the case of a move from 40 to 32, there's gonna be a 20% drop in that position. But we, again, we can't take the volatility out. What we want to do is help people sit through that and hold onto the position. Right, and, and, and yes, a 20% dro drop, as painful as that may be, is a lot better than a 50% drop if that's where the market eventually goes, right? Yeah, because we because we believe in it. We believe in it wholeheartedly. And yes, we continue to uh, adjust those collars, so to speak, and we'll continue to do so until, you know, which time we don't think it's necessary. So- Okay, um, and speaking of GDX in particular, I think you mentioned to me recently when we chatted offline that, that you guys were, were raising that, uh, those puts on your GDX position because it had been creeping up. Uh, is that true? We 
we recently, uh, well, that was a couple of months ago. We we did raise it up to uh, a level that is down near uh, near 30. We're probably going to be moving that higher in, in the very near future. So we haven't adjusted it in the last, I don't know, maybe six or eight weeks, but we're going to adjust it soon. because we're Okay, you're, you're, you're looking to adjust it soon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So last point here as we wrap up, guys. Um, uh, I... I issued a video yesterday about this kind of the carnage that happened in the cryptocurrencies. Uh, when was this now? Not last night, but the night before. And um, one of the charts that I mentioned, the video I'm going to pull up here, um, it's a chart of the gold to Bitcoin price ratio. And what's interesting about it is for the first time really in about a year, that ratio is moving higher after having been just on a steady decline for the past year. And uh, I think it's too early to claim a trend change, but it is interesting. It, it, there's a, an increasing amount of chatter out there on the internet right now and, and amongst investors that money may be beginning to, capital may be beginning to flow from the cryptocurrency space into the precious metals. You know, cryptocurrencies have run hot and hard for the past year, um, kind of to Rick's point about some of these commodities. I think people are waking up to the potential that uh, prices may have gotten ahead, maybe way, way ahead in certain coins than they should have. And that, that audience you know, is looking, uh, it invested in the cryptocurrencies for philosophical reasons um, and concerns about you know, purchasing power protection and all that stuff. And if you're removing it from the digital space, there aren't too many options out there that are better for that type of mindset than the precious metals. So you know, if, if the cryptocurrency complex continues to decline from here, um, we, we really may see an acceleration of this trend. So just curious if you guys have been noticing that. Um, John, I'll, I'll move it to you, but is that something you guys are keeping your eye on right now? Yeah, well, it's, it's hard not to notice the, the cryptocurrency arena uh, because it is um, for, for any and all kind of redeeming and legitimate um, uh, underpinnings of crypto, cryptocurrencies, it has been nothing short of a spectacle theater to see the kind of speculative and, and um, you know, a manic kind of uh, piling into anything that has crypto label on it. You know, um, some some coins that literally <laughs> Dogecoin is, was started as a joke, literally. And, and uh, you know, so many differences of that, for example, as compared to Bitcoin that, you know, most folks don't even realize it. And a lot of, a lot of folks, not to pick on Do Dogecoin, but, uh, you know, a lot of folks, uh, piled into it because of, uh, you know, Elon Musk tweets. Again, not to pick on Elon Musk, but man, uh, I, saw, I saw a thread today in some of the chat boards about people basically blaming Elon Musk for his tweets for why they lost their life savings. It's just like, you know, it's crazy what's going on in the space. Um, and, you know, even, even some of our very, our very clear thinking clients, I think are getting confused by so many different cross currents there because it is spectacle theater and it's really unhealthy. Well, um, agreed. I'm, again, I'm trying not to pick a fight with anybody here in the crypto space. Um, although on Dogecoin, I'm happy to beat on, on Dogecoin all day long. And I do on Twitter. I, I do think that that is probably you know, a historic um, milestone in terms of um, irrational investing. Um, so if, if the cryptos do have a material collapse from here or, or, or big price correction, um, when the history books are written, I think Dogecoin may be the new Dutch, toilet, uh, Dutch tulip story of the modern era. Um, all right. Well, with that, guys, we are at the end of our time here, um, but a great conversation with Rick. Really enjoyed uh, him as a guest. Can't wait to have him back on again. And I love how uh, you know, his key insights really seem to be um, brought to life very well by how you guys are managing uh, things there at New Harbor. Um, so uh, as we wrap up, uh, folks viewing, um, you know, I, I usually give kind of a list of things here at the end. I've got basically just two asks this week. Um, one is if you're a new viewer, you've enjoyed this conversation, you want to hear more like it, take a quick second, click the subscribe button below. And for everybody watching, um, if you thought this was a good interview and you've got anybody in your life who you think would benefit from these insights, please share this video with them. Um, we're trying this out. Um, if, uh, if we see the notable uptick in the people coming to the site we haven't seen before, um, we may continue to ask you to do this because really what we're trying to do here at the end of the day is we're trying to open people's eyes, increase awareness of uh, you know, what we think might be the, the more reality-based rules of how uh, money and capital formation um, really works. 
and uh, try to get some people that are maybe, you know, just um, uh, kind of sleepwalking through the current casino that these markets have become, maybe try to get their eyes opened a bit so that if some of these risks that, that Rick and we have been warning about come to fruition, they hopefully will have taken some prudent steps beforehand uh, to protect themselves, their wealth, and their family's financial futures. Um, all right, folks, with that said, if you wanna see who's coming on the program in the future, and we've got some great guests coming up in the next couple of weeks, just follow me on Twitter at, at Menlo Bear. And as a reminder to all, um, the good folks at New Harbor offer financial consultations to anybody who wants to talk to them and ask, hey, here's how my money's currently allocated. Here are my goals. Um, what should I be doing? They will do that for you for free, no strings attached. If you want to find out about that, stick around at the end of the video, which is coming up in just a few seconds. John and Mike, again, great conversation this week. Whatever the markets do from here, we will be tracking it together and trying to make sense of it for our viewers next week. So see you guys then. We will see you soon, Adam. Thanks again. See you then, Adam. Thanks. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with one of the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to Wealthion.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given their latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth and because Wealthion has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. We started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration, looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment or downright ridiculed by the standard financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type, the kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry, the market will always take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, we think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing. We strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership with a conscientious professional financial advisor who understands the risks in play. Now, we're agnostic which professional advisor you work with, as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you don't, or are having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Now, for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Wealthion and New Harbor, which we put in place to make sure everything is handled according to SEC regulations. All the details on this are clearly provided on the Wealthion.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA. But for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-U.S. clients. All right. With all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to Wealthion.com to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching. Thank you.